Naturally, as an Oxford professor of language, it should come as no surprise that Tolkien embedded over 100 poetic passages within this great literary work. So I had always wondered why Tolkien uses poetry so extensively in his writing, until I came to recognize two fundamental details. First, Tolkien composed his Middle-earth legendarium as if it had come from an actual ancient record. He was simply translating it into English for his 20th century audience. And it's because of this literary detail that Tolkien intentionally incorporated a sense of awkwardness in the text's wording in order to support this translation framework. And second, Tolkien viewed this record as a fundamentally religious text. So while this framework posits these as historical accounts from ancient authors, the narrator has also weaved within these various accounts a seamless depiction of Tolkien's theology. Now as a respected scholar of ancient languages, Tolkien felt it necessary to include numerous poetic passages throughout his Middle-earth accounts. These include psalms, lamentations, poetic prophecy, and proverbs, because Tolkien knew that these forms of poetry were a very natural characteristic of the ancient world. And that's especially the case for old world religious texts like the Hebrew Bible, which is what Tolkien was attempting to emulate. And while he committed over a decade in writing just The Lord of the Rings alone to accomplish this, unfortunately, after all that effort, upon publishing The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien came to recognize a glaring detail that he had overlooked. And that's that the vast majority of the poetic passages that Tolkien had embedded into his Middle-earth accounts used modern and rhyme poetry. And not only that, but these passages rhymed in English. This may seem like a minor detail to everyone else, but Tolkien was deeply embarrassed about this oversight and felt that it completely undercut his entire translation framework. Tolkien's mistake, which he unfortunately commits numerous times throughout the text, is that when pitted against each other, Tolkien consistently prioritizes the entertainment or reader's experience over the integrity of his translation framework. Now in the context of our comparative literary study between Tolkien's writing and the Book of Mormon, the question has to be asked. If the Book of Mormon claims to be an ancient text, then where is the poetry? And to be frank, for a long time, the text didn't really appear to have any. But it turns out there is poetry within the text. It simply took us over a century to recognize it for what it was. You see, because unlike Tolkien's record, which is filled with medieval and modern English poetry, the Book of Mormon seems far more committed to maintaining its old world framework. So rather than leaning on modern literary rhyme schemes, the author of the Book of Mormon demonstrates a familiarity with more ancient literary forms, such as poetic parallel phrases, member parallelism, climactic tricola, and progressionary tricolon. These are basic parallel features characteristic of ancient Hebrew and Canaanite poetry, but they simply don't stand out the same way to an English reader, especially when they've been stripped of their poetic form. And this is simply because Joseph Smith didn't write the Book of Mormon. He dictated it, and in doing so, didn't seem to offer any useful insight as to its punctuation or textual structure, which is fascinating. But perhaps more impressive, at least from a rendered English translation framework, are the examples of extended chiasm. Now, chiasm or chiasmus are a type of repetitive parallelism common in ancient Hebrew texts. And this is often characterized by inverse or mirror imagery. And this can happen on a small scale or at a much larger scale. Now, it's important to recognize that the presence of chiasmus does not equate to Israelite antiquity. There are many examples of other groups, both ancient and modern, that have intentionally employed chiastic structure in their work. And in fact, we need to consider that many small-scale chiasmus can simply occur inadvertently, meaning it was not the intent of the author to compose chiasm. It simply just came out that way. Now, the identification of chiasmus present in the Book of Mormon is a relatively new branch of study. And admittedly, some proponents in the field became a bit too excited at this prospect and proposed hundreds of instances of chiasmus throughout the text. Fortunately, there are studies that have helped us refine this approach in identifying authentic instances of chiasmus by gauging the author's intent by using statistical analysis. And it's because of these studies that we can now affirm the presence of real intentional chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. And no, it's not in the hundreds. Based on the evidence, there appear to be at least four Book of Mormon passages where the author clearly and intentionally has employed chiastic structure in both narrative and verse. We have two discourse passages from King Benjamin's speech to the people of Zarahemla in Mosiah 3 and Mosiah 5, and two narrative passages from Alma's final counsel to his sons. And perhaps the most impressive element about these passages is that they are employed by the type of person you would expect and in a manner and context that seems authentic to how old world chiasmus was often used. But here's the thing. It's at least interesting that old world poetic structures like chiasmus are present in the Book of Mormon. And it's impressive that the author employs it in a way that seems authentic to old world authorship. But it's absolutely fascinating that it took us over a century to recognize this literary detail.
If we are to assume that Joseph authored this text, we're now required to believe that at the age of 23, a lowly farm boy on the American frontier knowingly composed Hebraic parallelism and chiastic sermons, which he then embedded into a nearly 270,000 word complex literary work in which witnesses attest that he had no known source text or pre-written manuscript. He then dictated the entire literary work in a single draft to a scribe and offered no apparent insight into its literary structure. This would have led every poetic form that he had carefully crafted beforehand become completely lost the moment the words hit the paper. He then lived out the rest of his life without ever once calling attention to these poetic efforts. This narrative strains credulity when Tolkien himself could hardly make it through a single chapter without compromising his own translation framework. And before we add skilled Shakespearean poet to Joseph's ever-growing skill set, consider this. In the early 1840s, over a decade after the Book of Mormon was published, Joseph was criticized for his inability to prophesy in poetic verse. In fact, Joseph's own lawyer used this in a closing argument and pointed out that the only difference between Joseph and the biblical prophets of old was that old prophets prophesied in poetry and the modern in prose. You see, prior to that day, Joseph had never penned a single line in any poetic form. And this realization seems to have embarrassed some of the saints. So much so that one of Joseph's own scribes, William W. Phelps, makes an attempt to prompt Joseph into writing a poetic passage just a few weeks after the statement was made. And he does this by writing a letter to Joseph in poetic verse. He then asks Joseph to reply and join him in contemplating a heavenly paradise. Just a few weeks later, the saints published an editorial which bears the name The Answer which accounts one of Joseph's earliest revelations from 1832, but it's now presented in end rhyme poetic form. Many of the saints saw this as a direct response to Butterfield's comment and took this as evidence that Joseph truly was like the biblical prophets of old. But there's only one problem. This poetic form of Joseph's revelation isn't Joseph's work. And that's because all of the textual evidence and the overwhelming consensus of scholars today suggests that this poetic rendering of DNC 76 was actually the work of William W. Phelps. Or in other words, if Joseph truly was a closet poet, this was his time to show it, but he simply couldn't. And that's because Joseph simply does not have the literary skill set that the dominant critical narrative is forced to ascribe to him. Unlike Tolkien, Joseph wasn't a skilled poet. Unlike Tolkien, Joseph wasn't familiar with old world poetry. And unlike Tolkien, the author of the Book of Mormon consistently maintains its origin framework. Now, despite claims in the comments section, I don't need the Book of Mormon to be anything it's not. If this text truly is the work of Joseph Smith, then let the record show. But when I read the poetic lyricism of Nephi's Lament, or Zenith's Prayer, or Abinadi's Proclamation, I don't find myself engaging with a 23-year-old farm boy. I've found it to be something else. And I'll be honest, I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm committed to finding out.